so this lecture is actually in the module that says uh, blank PowerPoint slides. If you don't know they're there, they're here. You can write on them, you can download them, you can print them, you can use them just to take notes, whatever you need to do with them. Some people like them, so they're there. Um, but as I said, um, it's weird. Can you all see my screen, by the way? Someone let me know. Yeah, we can. Okay. Um, I'm not getting that green line around it that you normally get for whatever reason. That just kind of threw me. All right. So um, we're going to talk about Newton's laws. And it's something that I really would have liked to have talked about the first day or probably before now. But does anyone know Newton's laws? And I, I know I've asked this before. If anyone knows any of Newton's laws, just go ahead and tell me what they are. And if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, the first one that almost everyone says is an object at rest stays at rest, an object in motion stays in motion. And then they usually stop there. There's a second part to that. And that second part is unless acted upon by a force. And you might think you understand that, but there is a huge, I mean, a, a huge shift in thinking that occurred when Newton formulated that. Um, so you probably also all know the, um, the apocryphal, meaning probably untrue story. Newton was, the plague was raging through Europe, so much like COVID. He went to his family's estate to get away from people. And while he was there, supposedly an apple hit him on the head and he got this whole idea. That's probably not true, but I will tell you what he tried to answer. And it's something I brought up last week or the week before, is he saw an apple fall and he went, why? Why would it fall straight down? I mean, why not fall at an angle? If, it, if it's released from rest, what would make an apple fall? Why does it fall? What, like, what is the point of something falling out of your hand and hitting the ground? Why does that even work? And in order to actually pose that question in a intelligent, rigorous way, he had to define a bunch of stuff that hadn't really been defined. Um, and so the first thing that he had to define was a force. Can anyone tell me what a force is without using Newton's terminology? It's almost impossible. Um, you know that force equals mass times acceleration. Well, that's a definition of what a force is. A force is anything that acts on an object to change its motion, period, okay? It doesn't have to change the motion, but it could change the motion. The reason why it doesn't have to is it could be opposed by other forces, so the motion doesn't change. But if a force is acting, its only purpose is it changes the motion. It changes the velocity of the object with time, um, depending on how long it's applied. But Newton had to say, okay, well, if an object falls, there must be a force on it that's making it fall down. So he has his apple, and his apple's falling to the ground, right? And he says, oh, there's a force. There must be a force between the earth and the apple that's causing it to fall. And then he realized, well, wait, if there's a force on the apple due to the earth, then there better be a force on the earth due to the apple as well. And so he realized there was this equation of gravity, which depends on the masses, which we'll talk about, and it depends on the distance between them. But he realized that for every force, there had to be an equal and opposite force acting between two objects. And we'll talk about that third law in a minute. But forces aren't equal. 
And you probably already know this. I weigh a lot more than probably a lot of you in this class. I'm 6'4". I weigh about 190 pounds. Um, someone in the class probably weighs 100 pounds. If you hit me with a force of 30 newtons, I'm going to be accelerated somewhat. And if you hit that 100 pound person with a force of 30 newtons, they're going to be accelerated more. What's the difference between us? Well, the difference between us is our mass. But mass is a really weird thing. Um, it turns out that while you know what mass is, you don't know what mass is. What is mass? And you might say, wait, it's not weight. It's not what you weigh. It's actually how much stuff, if you have one electron, you have so much mass. If you have two of them, you have double the mass. So it's how much stuff something's made of. But that's not what we're here to talk about. We're not here really to talk about stuff. We're here to talk about motion. And what does mass have to do with motion? Well, in Newton's equation, force equals mass times acceleration, the mass actually prevents the acceleration. Why? Well, you take the acceleration and you get force over mass. So mass slows you down. It keeps you from accelerating the more mass you have. Um, the acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of an object. If I hit a fly with a 100 newton force, that fly goes sailing across the room. If I hit a building with a 100 newton force, nothing happens to the building. Your weight is actually your mass times g. But that's equal to the force that you apply on gravity, right? Well, this force is equal to the mass times the acceleration, but this is the mass of the Earth and the acceleration of the Earth due to you because the mass of the Earth is so huge, this acceleration due to your mass on the Earth is nothing. It couldn't even be measured how much you're changing the Earth's motion just by standing on the surface of the Earth. It's almost immeasurable, okay? We're here to talk about Newton's laws. I'm going to talk later when we do gravity. Um, there are really actually two other things that Newton did with forces and mass that almost never get talked about except in higher level physics, but they're really important. And one of those is that he realized, and we're gonna use this today, that if you have an object being attracted by the earth, every single little mass on the earth is attracting that mass. And when you do this integral, you realize that you can treat the Earth as if it's a point mass, meaning all of its mass were at an infinitesimal point at the center of the Earth. And all the mass of the apple is at an infinitesimal point at the center of the apple, called the center of mass. And it acts like all you have are two little points that the forces are acting between. That's super important. We're going to make these models using blocks. The blocks visually represent the center of mass point of an object. Um, super, super important though, that he showed that it doesn't matter how big the object is, it acts like all of its mass is at its center of mass. The other thing he showed was that inside um, mass, if you had a hole and you were falling through a hole to the center of the earth, only the mass that's at your same radius or within um, actually affects the force of gravity. And we'll talk about that when we do chapter 13. But we're here to talk about his laws. So we really should, I believe, that Newton's second law should really be his first law. His second law is that definition that everyone knows, force equals mass times acceleration. Um, however, what you probably don't know is that number one, this is actually the working definition. The acceleration of an object due to a force divided by its mass. This tells you what mass is. It tells you that mass acts as an inertial force or an inertial, it basically um, stops the force or limits the force depending on the mass or lack thereof. 
The other thing that you probably don't know is these are external forces. And we're gonna talk about that a lot later. Um, we're gonna talk about that when we do a third lesson. So we have this definition, but this definition is actually, for a system of particles, it's the sum of external forces. Don't worry about that quite yet. Is equal to the sum of the masses times the net acceleration on the system. We can also break it down into its components. So the sum of the forces in X are equal to the mass times A of X. The sum of the forces acting in Y are equal to MAY. The sum of the forces in Z are MAZ. All of Newton's laws come out of this, okay? Meaning his other two laws, first law and second law. His first law, that object at rest stays at rest, object in motion stays in motion. It's just a special case of when F equals MA if A is zero. That implies that the acceleration is zero implies the velocity doesn't change. So it implies constant velocity or vice versa. If I tell you that an object or a system is moving with constant velocity, you know that A is zero. That's what it means when you read it in a problem. This right here means that A is zero. Obviously, if there's no acceleration and the object's not moving, it's not going to start moving. <clears throat> Unless, so how do we make an object move? Well, we supply an external force. Now, what is an external versus an internal force? I'm assuming you're all sitting in a chair. Your body, you might be doing like I am fidgeting, but if you held yourself still, you're not moving but everything in your body's moving. There are a ton of forces holding your body together. You have muscles under tension, all of that. The deal is that although forces are internal to your system and every single one of them has an equal and opposite force that is canceling it out. So when you move, it's because there's a external force. There is an object acting on you that is causing you to accelerate in some way, shape, or form. So Newton's third law is really about internal and external forces. For every force due to an object A acting on an object B, there's a second force from B acting on A. Take your hand and push into the table or desk or your computer or whatever. Push against your hands, okay? If you push against the desk, no matter how, how hard you push, nothing happens, right? And that's because the table is actually pushing back on your fingers. The big deal about this is they have to be two objects acting on each other. It can't be two objects acting on one object. It can't be one object with two forces acting on it. Even if the forces are equal, they're not a third law pair unless it's two objects like my right hand and my left hand pushing on each other. These two are a third law pair, the forces between them. Um, gravity and my arm pushing my hand up, gravity pulling my hand down are not a third law pair, even though they're equal and opposite if my hand doesn't move. We'll talk about that. Internal forces always cancel. There are always third law pair internal forces in any system that we make. I should say that when I talk about a system, I'm talking about any number of particles. It'll become clear when we do some work. Um, but a system is all the different particles that make up whatever you want um, to be that system, okay? And all the internal forces cancel each other out, which means we don't need to consider them actually. And I'm gonna talk about that much later. But internal forces cancel. So the only acceleration on the system has to be from external forces. And that's going to lead us into our, our ideas of how to handle Newton's laws and use them to predict motion. So I wanna make absolutely clear what a third law pair is. Right now, if you stand up, you're standing on the ground and you're pushing down on the ground with a force equal to your weight where your weight is mass times acceleration. 
So this is mg. That is your weight, okay? The ground pushes up on you. So I should say this is weight is mg. The ground pushes up on you with something called a normal force. Now, why is it a normal force and what does it do? Any surface that an object rests on, that surface pushes perpendicular to the surface, meaning at 90 degrees from the surface, it pushes against the object. The normal force is a variable force depending on how strongly the object's pushing. We don't need it so much today. Today, it's a curiosity. On Thursday, it is super important because it ends up determining how much friction you have, how hard you push on a surface. Um, but the ground pushes up with something called a normal force. A normal force, a normal, if you don't know where the word comes from, there's something called a carpenter square, which allows you to make precise 90 degree angles. In Latin, in the Roman world, those squares were called normals. So our word norm comes from something that's perpendicular. The normal for force is perpendicular to a surface. But we use it to mean the force that an object pushes back on you. I want to make something really clear about this course. What is the normal force? What is actually pushing on you? We don't care. We only care how it affects your motion. What is pushing on you is the electromagnetic forces and the structure, the crystalline structure trying not to break and blah, 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 blah. We don't care about any of that. We just say, oh, there's a normal force that keeps you from falling through the floor. Now the mass of the earth pulls on you, pulls you to the center of the earth. We say that's your weight. So you have a weight that you're standing on the ground with and you have a weight due to the earth pulling on your mass and they're equal. Are they the same? Mm, kind of, we'll get to that. Um, you also though, by Newton's idea, you pull on the earth. You pull the earth towards your center of mass. So the earth is actually being pulled up by all of us. Okay. So we have these four forces and we want to know which ones are third law pairs. The rule is simple. They have to act on two different objects and they have to be acting on each other and they have to be equal and opposite, but always two objects. If you're asked this on an MCAT or you're asked this on, you know, some kind of grad school exam or something, is it a third law pair? It always has to be two objects. So the ground pushes up on you and the earth pulls down on you. They are equal. The normal force is equal to your weight. Are they a third law pair? The answer is no. They have to be two different objects and those are both forces acting on you. And we're always going to write the forces that act on an object or on you, but this is not a third law pair because they're both acting on you. Two different objects, but they're both acting on you. They have to be acting on two different objects. Actually, they have to be acting on each other. So here, the ground pushes up on you, and you push down on the ground. These are equal and opposite, and they're both equal to your weight. But they are a third law pair. They cancel out. That's why you don't fall through the floor, okay? Or go shooting off into the sky because the normal force isn't greater than your weight. They exactly cancel and you just stand there. Here, the earth pulls down on you and you pull up on the earth. These are also a third law pair. You're acting on the earth, the earth is acting on you, but these have nothing to do with each other. They are not third law pairs. These, if you tried to do this one and this one, they would both be acting on you. In a sense, these two would both be acting on the earth, okay? You keep that in mind that third law pairs have to be on two different objects. I'm gonna go through as we do this and highlight where we're using first law, second law, or third law. Um, but other than that, you don't need to know it. I may ask it on an exam, like I may give a question that says which one of Newton's laws applies in this situation. Um, but I'll tell you guys a hint. There's almost all of you are here right now. The hint is they all apply, right? 
if we're talking about motion with forces, they all apply um, in general. I mean, if I was asking about tensions, yeah, I'm really talking about third law. But in general, you could say second law applies because F equals MA. And the first law applies because the acceleration is zero or the acceleration is not zero. That's what object at rest stays at rest unless acted upon by a force. And the third law says that any force has an equal and opposite force. If a force is acting on an object due to some other object, that other object has a force acting on it due to the original object. Um, and hopefully you'll understand that later as we go. So this is super important as we begin to do problems. This is actually really important to what is going to be our algorithm. We have different types of forces. Um, I should say here that in general, we're going to use, sorry, blocks. So we're going to draw like a square on a flat surface, and we're going to call this a mass. And then we're going to put forces acting on it. So if I'm pushing it or I'm pulling it to the right, I draw an arrow and I put F. Um, if there's a rope, um, say that you attach it to a rope, then I know there's going to be a tension force on mass M due to this rope. Tensions are actually kind of the hard thing. We're going to go over it a lot, but tensions are, are kind of the one that people have the most trouble with. Um, there's always a weight. If we're assuming that X, let me not do that. Um, if we're assuming X is to the usual right and Y is up, then we know that the weight goes toward the center of the earth and the weight is mg. So we'll always have a weight vector, always. Every object has a weight vector. Every object has weight. Then we have a normal, and a normal is only if it's on a surface. We're going to talk about things where a block is hanging by a rope from a pulley. They're not on a surface, but if they're on a surface, they have a normal force that points perpendicular away from the surface, meaning 90 degrees off the surface. And then finally, we have this last force, friction. Friction is what we're going to do on Thursday. The reason why we're doing friction by itself is friction does not act like other forces, and it's easier to handle once you know how to do all the general problems. Okay, so moving on. Oh, before I move on. So what this means for our algorithm is you, all you have to do is when you draw a free body diagram, remember, are there any forces on it? Are there any tensions on it? Are there any weight? Is there a normal? Um, that's it to make this easy. It'll make more sense later. But um, just keep in mind, we have four types of forces. And those are the only things you need to worry about. These are the only forces we have in that class. We have a general weird force. We have a tension force anytime there's a rope. We have a weight on any object pointing towards the center of the Earth. And we have a normal force perpendicular to a surface. All right. These conditions are also true. So these two slides are probably super important early on for you. In this class, we are going to assume that the forces are always constant unless I tell you otherwise. Or now, you're going to assume that the forces are constant, and that means the accelerations are constant, and we already have these acceleration equations. X final minus X initial is V, initial t plus a t squared over two. V final is equal to V initial plus a t. Um, v final squared minus V initial squared is equal to two a x final minus x initial. So make sure you remember those. Um, what usually happens is you draw a free body diagram. You use that free body diagram to write f equals ma for the x direction and for the y direction for every object. You then do some algebra and you get the acceleration. Once you have the acceleration because you know it's constant, if I told you that it started from rest and went to the right for three seconds, you could tell me what the final velocity is or you could tell me how far it went. 
So you're going to need to know these three equations, but you already know them from projectile motion, from constant acceleration, from free fall, except in those free fall and projectile motion, A is minus G when these are Ys, and A is zero when they're Xs, right? So we're not doing too much we haven't really done before, and we're doing a whole bunch of different stuff. Uh, the math isn't hard in this chapter at all. A little bit of algebra that gets really tedious, but anyway. So forces are constant means accelerations are constant. Objects do not leave the surfaces they're on. That means that if I'm pulling a block this way with some force or rope or tension, this block can't go up or down. That means that along the surface's perpendicular component, the acceleration is always zero. We'll go over that um, as we go. All ropes are stretchless, frictionless, massless. What that means is if I have two objects connected by a rope and I pull one of them, okay, with some force, they both have to move with the same acceleration and velocity, the same distance. So we can relate M1 to M2, the accelerations will be the same. We could also have a pulley, and you'll see this later, with mass one, and it's connected to a block two. But we know as one falls, because these ropes can't stretch, they have no mass, they have no friction, however far one falls, two moves to the right. Um, we'll talk about that later too. So that implies that along the rope direction, the accelerations are the same. And we'll get to that. That's going to be the second or third example we do. Gravity is always going to be 9.81 meters per second squared in the direction of the Earth. However, that's a lie. Um, actually, on an exam, if you really want to, if you want to change g to 10 meters per second squared, I'm okay with that. Unless I specifically tell you to use 9.81, you can use 10. You can round it. It makes the algebra faster. And to be honest with you, it doesn't change your answer all that much. Um, in Wiley, in the homework, make sure you use 9.8 or 9.81. Um, but notice that that is not negative 9.81. G is just G. Don't put a negative sign on there. You'll see how we get negative signs and positive signs and all that good stuff in a minute. And then all masses are point masses. And so I'm going to stop here for a minute and talk about something. Some of you are going to be biologists. Some of you are going to be chemists. Some of you are going to be computer scientists, all that stuff. However, um, for those of you that are going into non-theoretical physics, most science, how you do it is you have some system and you need to model it. So let's say I have a wall and I have some cell in biology that's connecting itself to a wall. And what I actually do is I would think of this as a block on a spring. And I do all my physics as if it were a block because it doesn't matter. I don't need the cell to be that complex. I just need to understand the motion of it. And it would act like a point mass on a spring. And we'll talk about those chapter like eight, I think. But what we're really doing here is we're taking some system. It could be a car, you know, going up a hill. We're taking some system and we're modeling it as a block with ropes and pulleys, and that's all we're doing. So when you see in all these problems, you see a block or you see a pulley and you see a weight attached, know that in the real world, what we're doing is we're making a very simplified model of a system as if they were point masses that act just like blocks and strings. Um, I've always found it kind of hilarious that you probably started off as a very small child playing with blocks, and then you realize our first ideas in science are usually to create a model that's just blocks. We never stop playing with blocks. It's because humans need things that they can easily understand and are simplified in order to understand them. When things get too complex, you lose the ability to grasp what's going on. 
that being said, yeah, you'll start off modeling cells as little blocks. If you go to grad school and they are going to teach you or you're going to research ways to make that block more and more like what a real cell does. So just keep in mind that these little stupid block and, and rope models are actually really powerful for understanding the motion of a system. And if we have a block that's falling, you can imagine a cell falling through, you know, a vein or something, you know, something weird like that, if it helps you do that. Um, and that's what you're going to do. You start off with the simplest model you can and you make it increasingly more complex to learn more. And that's all that science is. It's making better and better models from super simple models. Some of our models have to be simple because we simply can't um, compute, or at least when I was your guys' age, we didn't have the computer power available to most of us to be able to model these things. You guys are lucky in some ways and not lucky in others that you can model things like fluid flow in a computer and see if it converges and, and works. You can model something like proteins in a cell that you didn't used to be able to do. Um, what you used to have to do is model as a block with some ropes on it and then use that to infer whether or not you had the model right by how good your numbers were to experiment. Um, so anyway, long digression. All I mean to say is, yeah, we're talking about blocks and ropes and pulleys, but I want you to realize that these are models of the real world and they do predict motion quite accurately if you know what the forces are and the accelerations and all that and the masses. Okay, so let's start with our easiest problem in the world. We have a block, we're pulling on it with a force to the right. Um, it's on a flat frictionless surface. First thing we do, we draw that on the flat surface. We put an arrow showing that the force is to the right. We just draw what we were talking about. Then we draw a free body diagram. This is a free body diagram. What you do is you go through this and you write all the forces that are on this block and only on this block. And remember I said that we had forces and we had tensions and we had weights and we had normal forces. And those were all you had to concern yourself with. So as I look at this, I draw a little circle and I put an M. First things first, make sure you decide which way you're gonna call X and which way you're gonna call Y. Um, because that's going to define why it should always be positive away from the center of the earth, mostly, um, unless we're on an inclined plane. Uh, so you do have a choice with either one of these. I could have chose X to be positive going to the left. I chose it to the right, not because that's the way you traditionally see it in your math class, but because I know that the force is pulling it to this direction. And so that's, probably going to be my positive direction if I want the motion to be positive. This force is going to accelerate this mass to the right, so I might as well choose x to be positive to the right. And then I don't have a bunch of weird negative signs to worry about. There is a normal force associated with this surface perpendicular to the surface, straight up. So I draw it straight up. I draw my force to the right. There's always a weight associated with every mass. So there's a weight that goes straight down towards the center of the earth. And this weight is mg. We'll see that, but it's mg. We always, 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 you all have to do this. You will get dot points for this on an exam. You need to draw the positive axes. You need to tell me which way you're calling positive, And you'll see why as we do these problems. Uh, it's helpful. Um, another thing is three o'clock right now. I'm not going to take a break. If you need a break, take one. This will be recorded. Um, I'm not going to take a break though. Uh, I'm going to go through this. Hopefully I'll be done by four. Okay, so we have this. We've drawn a free body diagram. Should we draw the force of the mass acting on the floor? So should we draw like a normal of the mass acting on a floor? No. We only draw the forces acting on the object. 
the floor is actually not part of our system. So this normal force from the floor out, up is actually um, an external force. And this weight down is actually an external force. It's a force due to the earth. And this force is like someone's attached a rope to this block and is pulling or whatever. Okay, so once I've done that, so here's the trick. What I write is I look at these and notice in the X, so I write for F of X is M A X, and then I just write the sum of all the forces in the X. I chose this direction to be positive. So this F is positive, and that's it. I'm done with the X. So this is A, not A times X. This is A in the X direction, okay? Similarly for Y. Now F of Y is going to be M A Y. I chose Y to be positive up. So that means N is positive. Omega is down, it's negative. This is in the negative Y direction. So I put a negative sign here. This is my Newton's equations. All I write is MA is equal to the forces from the free body diagram. Positive is the positive direction you chose. And it has to match, it has to be consistent. That's it. If someone were to ask me, well, what equations do we need to learn for chapter five? You don't, you need F equals MA. You need to know that the forces can be forces, tensions, weight, and normals, but that's all you need to know. All right, so what I've just done, I did here, okay? Now, the sum of the forces you just set to MAX, or the sum of the forces in Y you set to MAY. Once I've done this, okay, there are two things that I, well, I'll go through the X and then I'll go through the Y. So if we assume that that force were two Newtons, now someone brought this up, a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. This is mass, this is acceleration. That's what a Newton is. It's a capital N, so don't confuse the normal force of Newtons. Um, but if I gave you a mass and I gave you a force, you could give me acceleration because you know acceleration is meters per second squared. If I take the force over the mass, that's Newtons divided by kilograms, we get acceleration, right? In these problems, we almost always find the acceleration in the X. That's the first thing we look for. So our acceleration in the X, we only have this equation. Our acceleration in the X is F over M, and it's four meters per second squared. So now we know it. At this point, you usually will have the next part of the question, and that will be something like, if it starts from rest, how far does it travel in three seconds? You know this is constant. V initial is zero if it starts from rest, T is three, and you can use X final minus X initial is V naught T plus A T squared over two. This is zero, this is zero. A is four, T is three, so three times three is nine, that's 36 divided by two, 18 meters, okay? That's about all you're ever going to do with these. You're going to use a free body diagram to get F equals MA with all the appropriate forces, solve those to get the accelerations, and then use the accelerations in some kind of constant acceleration equation. Of course, it's way more complicated than that. Um, in the Y direction, because it can't leave this surface, we know that A, and another thing that people sometimes do is they'll write A of X and A of Y. You can do either one of these. Um, I'm going to read this A of X vector as X is positive in that direction. And this A of Y is A is positive. I don't care if you do that. But looking at this, if this block can't leave this surface, we assume that the acceleration in this Y direction here has to be zero. So if I go back here and I look at this, um, if this side of this equation is zero, then I see that N is equal to W and W is MG. Therefore, my normal force is just my weight. 
That's all this is. So I know my normal force. I know my weight is mg. I know my normal force is equal to my weight. So my normal force is 0.5 kilograms times the acceleration of gravity, 9.81, gives me 4.905 newtons. Okay. All right. That might strike you as a little bit weird that in this particular case, the weight is only 4.905. That I probably shouldn't have used to half. I probably should have used like 10 kilograms. But um, yeah, that's all it is. This is, if you understand this example from slide 12 to slide 14, um, you've got this stuff. Now, of course, we're going to make it more complicated. And there's a lot of ways we can make it more complicated. In this first example of making it more complicated, how about instead of a force in the x direction, I have a force at 30 degrees. What I really want to do is redraw this as a force in the x and a force in the y. Just like with a vector, this is f cosine of 30, this is f sine of 30. Okay. And then all you have to do is do a free body diagram. So I have f of y, I have f of x, I still have my normal because it's on a surface, I still have my weight. And then I go f equals ma, the only force in the x is f cos 30. Fy equals ma, the forces in the y are f of y, f sine theta, plus the normal, minus the weight. And I need to make sure that I do not forget to indicate which way I chose to be x positive and y positive. That way I can go from here straight to here, right? And I go from here straight to here. This is the reason why we use a free body diagram. You can look right at the free body diagram and read what the equations of motion are. And you can also show everybody exactly what the forces are, right? Free body diagrams are really, really useful. I don't know why the signs have a space in between them. These are signs. So. Now, A of X in this case would only be F cos M. What were our forces? Um, two Newtons and M is a half. So if F were two Newtons, theta, or I guess that's V. I should really draw theta. Theta is 30 and m is 0 0.5 kilograms, 30 degrees. Then this would be two newtons times cos of 30. Cos of 30, is that a half? I always forget. Uh, no, it's 8.6 or 0.866. Um, times 0.5 or times two again. I get 3.46 uh, meters per second squared. Okay, now again, in the Y, it can't leave the surface. So A of Y is zero. If I set this equation equal to zero, I get F sine plus normal minus weight. I could solve this for the normal, move F sine over, move the weight over, and I get weight minus F sine. This gives me, if I do this, um, remember this is, 0 0.5 times 9.81 minus 2 sine 30. This is 1 half of, so 0 0.5 times 9.81 times 2, sorry, 0 0.5 times 9.81 minus 2 sine of 30, which is a half. I get 3.905 newtons. Now, what is this telling us? And I, I mean you, I mean for you to really think about this. Unlike the first one, we have a force at an angle, which means part of this force is actually lifting off the mass off the surface. But since it can't leave the surface, what it's actually doing is it's reducing the amount of normal forces, reducing how much of the weight is pushing on the surface, and that's what it's telling us. So if you and your friend are trying to push 
like a big heavy cabinet across the room and your friend's pushing at an angle of 45 degrees and you're pushing at zero degrees, yell at your friend. Or maybe not. Maybe your friend's actually helping by getting the normal force off the floor. But when you're at an angle, less of the force is in the direction of motion and more of it goes in the Y direction. You could actually push it enough at an angle that there is no normal force, right? That the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, that there is no normal force, that the weight and the force cancel, which is kind of good to know. Um, but remember that if that's the case, in this class, we're assuming things can't leave the surface, which means F sine theta can never be bigger than the weight because then the normal would be negative and that makes no sense. Um, so at that point, you just say that the normal is zero um, if the force were bigger than the weight and it stays on the floor somehow. That shouldn't happen though. All right, next way to make it harder. What if we had two objects? When we have two objects, so we have a mass two that's being pulled by a force, but it's attached by a stretchless, frictionless, massless rope to mass one. That means that they are both going to move to the right with the same velocity and acceleration. Okay. And they're not going to leave the surface either. So how we handle two objects is we draw a free body diagram for each one. Choose y and x, y and x. For this one, I have my normal weight. I always put a 1 or an A or whatever I want to call this mass. But I have normal 1 up, and I have weight 1 down. And then I have this rope. And this rope is connecting 1 and 2. Okay, They're connected together. There are There is a tension on 1 due to 2 that is pulling 1 to the right. There is a tension on 2 due to 1 that is pulling 2 to the left. And we write these like this. You could also write these as just tension one and tension one. You could write them as the same. We'll get to that in a minute. But um, if there was like a third object with a second rope, you would need to somehow um, differentiate between these two tensions and the tensions from the other ropes. We'll do that later. But for now, just know that when you have a rope, you have a tension on both objects that the rope's attached to. And they're in opposite directions. So really, um, what it is is that this one's being pulled back to one, and this guy's being pulled forward to two by those tensions. They're a third law pair. They're equal and opposite. We'll show that. So remember, go down force, tension, weight, normal. There's a normal for each of them. They both get an M1 and M2. The one means mass one, the two means mass two. They both get a weight. These tensions go backwards and I draw the force. And I'm done. I wrote the Y and X, Y and X for both of them. Make sure that your X's are consistent because there's going to be an acceleration in the X of one in that direction and an acceleration in the x for two in that direction, and they're gonna be equal. And you'll see why that is in a second. All right, so when I go back and look, just concentrating on this guy, the force in the x is m1a1x, and it's tension two over one, as I've written here. The force in the y is n minus omega one, or w1, which is n1 minus m1g. Remember, a y is zero. That just means n1 is equal to weight one. Here, if we look, when we do the x for number two, the force is positive, the tension is negative. And I write the tension on two due to one. That's how I write these little subscripts. So m2a2x is f minus t1 over two. Again, M2A2Y is N2 minus W2 or weight 2. That means since it can't leave the surface, this is 0, and N2 is equal to M2G. So right now we have that N1 and N2 are equal to W1 and W2, which are the weights. 
M1G and M2G. That's what these y equations are telling us. Then we have this equation and this equation. So we have two equations, but we need to somehow do something with them. M1A1X is equal to T2 on one. M2A2X is equal to T1 on two. I'm sorry, F minus T1 on two. So now, a couple things. We know that those two tensions are a third law pair. That means they're equal and opposite. That means that they're equal. T12 minus T21 should give us zero. They cancel each other out. That means they're equal. Let's just call them T. So I'm going to erase these guys so that you can see this. And I get M1A1X is T. M2A2X is equal to F minus T. And you can see right here what we're going to do. Okay. I'm actually going to show you a quick trip, trick. I could, number one, solve the bottom equation for t. Um, I'm sorry. I could, number one, um, plug in. t is m1a1x here, and I would get m2a. Don't do it there. I'm not going to do it there for a reason. So I get m2a2x is equal to f minus m1a1x. Another trick that you might not know, you can subtract equations or add them. What if I add these equations? I get M1A1X plus M2A2X is equal to T plus F minus T. You can just add both sides. The T's cancel and this becomes F. Um, I hope you guys can see that. That's actually useful sometimes to solve this stuff fast when you don't want to do substitutions. Um, so doing either of those, this is actually, if I move this over, I get this equation. So doing that, you get that. Now though, because they're stretchless, frictionless, massless, and they're along the rope. So remember that the rope goes this way in the X direction, A of X, because these are stretchless, frictionless, massless, the accelerations have to be the same. The positions have to change the same. The velocities have to change the same. The velocities have to be the same. Otherwise, the rope would stretch, right? That just implies that A1 is equal to A2 here. And so we can say that F is equal to M1A1X plus M2A2X, or that it's M1 plus M2 both times AX. Notice this equation when you compare it. The tensions disappeared. The tensions we had here, they disappeared. Why did they disappear? They disappeared because they're internal forces. And what Newton's second law tells us is that the sum of the external forces, and in this, the system is mass one and two, the only external force is F. The sum of the external forces is equal to the sum of the masses, m1 plus m2, times the net acceleration. That's really useful, but we've just shown Newton's definition. Um, again, if we wanted m1 and m2 to be equal masses, they don't have to be, but let's say they were equal to 0 0.5 kilograms, and the force was two newtons again, then F over M1 plus M2 would be equal to A of X. This would be two over 0.5 plus 0.5, which is one. So this would be two meters per second squared. Um, and once you have that, you could, I could say, oh, well, if it's initially moving at two meters per second to the right, you know, after four more seconds, how far has it moved? Something like that. I'm not gonna do those. Those I think are pretty easy to do. Another side note on the exam. Um, so you might say, well, why aren't we gonna have like constant acceleration that we did in chapter two? You are, it's going to be in these three body diagram inclined plane problems. Um, so it's not that we're not using that material or that we've forgotten that material. We're using it, it's just part of solving these problems that we already know.
Okay. So I've done that. Um, the tensions are internal third law pairs, so they don't appear in the final equation. The accelerations along the rope have to be the same. More on that later. The objects can't leave the surface, so ay. This says that ay is zero. This says that a1x is equal to a2x is equal to just a and the x. This says that t1, 2 and t2, 1 cancel, so they don't appear. These are Newton's laws. Um, force is constant, so A is constant, and we can use constant acceleration equations. All right, so you've seen one block with a force in the Y or in the X, one block with the force at an angle, and two blocks co connected together. So now what should I do? Well, now is the other type of block. Imagine you have a pulley. And we're going to assume that all pulleys are massless and frictionless. They basically just redirect the force. We're going to assume, though, that this one is like hooked to the ceiling, and there's enough rope for this thing to just fall, this mass to just fall. Now here, if we just have one mass, we know it's going to drop. So it's often useful to say that this is the positive direction. Positive what? Well, let's call it y. Um, however, I could have something weird where something's pulling this mass up and I would flip this. But for now, um, I'm going to say y. I don't need x. In these particular problems, I don't need an x here. The motion is along the rope. So what I get for a free body diagram is I get m. Remember, force, tension, weight, normal. There's no normal force. There's always a weight towards, we're going to assume that down is towards the center of the earth. So that's the weight. Is there a tension? Yes. This is actually a tension due to the pulley, but we call it a tension because it's a rope. And is there any other forces? No. Okay. And weight is still mg. So when I write my equations, all I have to write is f is equal to ma. Here, though, a is in the down positive direction. So what are my forces? If down is positive, the weight is positive. Down is positive, the weight is positive, the tension is negative. If um, this thing were rising and up was the positive direction of travel, then you would draw this and you would get that MA is T minus W. It's really up to you how you define it. Um, if you don't know, choose one. And if you get a negative acceleration, then you know you chose poorly, right? Um, so if I want to know what the tension is here, well, I would have to know how fast it's accelerating. So if I told you it was moving with constant velocity, what is the tension in that rope? Constant velocity implies that A is zero. It's going down. If a is zero, if zero is equal to t, um, if zero is equal to w minus t, then t is equal to w, which is equal to mg. And let's say I told you that this mass was four kilograms. So this tension would be four times 9.81 or 36, 39, uh, about 40 newtons. Tensions are forces, they're newtons, okay? This is why I say, like, if you want to use 10 sometimes, use 10. Now, your book might try to give you, or Wiley Plus might try to give you, um, like, signs and stuff, like negative J. Well, the tension's in the positive J, but I don't do that. And the reason why is the acceleration directions change, and you're going to see that really fast. Um, two slides from here. It'll make sense to you. So if you have a question about that, just hang on. So now, just like before, we can make it more difficult by assuming that we have two masses connected. And in this problem, what we have is we have mass one 
and mass two. What direction do these things presumably go in? Well, two's gonna fall and one's gonna go to the right, okay? So what we do, if we have two, we draw a free body diagram for each one. One and two. Now remember F, tension, normal, weight. Does number one have a normal? Yes, it's resting on a surface. And you can call that normal one if you want. Does two have a normal? No, it's hanging in space as it drops. We're assuming this surface is frictionless and flat. Um, do they have a weight? Well, they all have a weight. Any mass has a weight. So this is weight one, this is weight two. Do they have a tension? Yes, they both do. This guy has a tension, which I'm just gonna call T, pulling it to the right. This guy has a tension up, pulling it up, right? That's because this rope, there's a force due to two that's pulling one to the right. There's a force due to one that's pulling two upward. Okay. Now, finally, have we left any forces off? No. What I now want you to do is write the direction of X and Y or AX and AY, if you prefer. Remember though, that this is going to be A1 and A2. Now that you've got your free body diagram, what do you write? F is equal to M1 a one x f is equal to m one a one y f one uh, x i guess one y two y is equal to m two a two y in the x direction there's a tension and it's positive because i chose to the right to be positive in the y direction i have n one minus weight one I chose down to be the positive direction for this guy. I need to keep it consistent if this A, then this A, because along the rope direction, I'm going along the rope. I wanna keep the positive direction along the rope consistent. If I don't do that, I'll end up with a negative sign. That makes no sense. So this is down, is positive. So I get weight two minus T. Okay. Now I know that this is zero. And what this, because it can't leave the surface. This just tells me that M1 is equal to weight one, which is M1G. Like I said, um, on Thursday, we'll need to find normal forces. For now, it doesn't really matter with these um, non-frictional surfaces. Here T is M1A1X. So this equation becomes M2A2Y, is equal to M2 minus M1 A1X. But I can see from my drawing that A1X and A2Y have to be the same because of frictionless, stretchless, massless ropes, okay? So A1X is equal to A2Y. They have to be the same as long as the direction's right. That means I can just call these A. What I get, if I move this over, is I get M1 plus M2 times A is equal to weight two. And remember that weight two is M2G. Now, um, I'm gonna actually do something really fast. I said that M1 plus M2 times A is equal to the force, external force, M2G. Look at my system. The only external force in the direction of travel is the weight of two, is the earth pulling two down. The sum of the masses is M1 plus M2 times A net, and the net acceleration is to the right. So this is or down. So what I get here though, is that A is equal to M2 over M1 plus M2. And I want you to check something. If I all of a sudden got rid of M1, what should the acceleration on M2 be? It should be positive G as it falls. So if I get rid of M1 here, I get M2 over M2, that means that A is just G. 
if I get rid of M2, if I cut this rope and I take this mass away, what is the acceleration on one? Well, it should be zero. If nothing's pulling on it, if there's no tension due to mass two, if I say that M2 is zero, I get zero over M1, and I get zero. So this equation is correct. And it's something I want you to all start to get used to doing, especially with these. If you can, to check your answer, just assume you take away one mass and you know what happens and see if your answer is correct. You also may have noticed I haven't been putting numbers in until the very end, if I even do it then. <coughs> That's because at this point, if I told you that M1 was four and M2 was eight, I could ask you what A is. Um, it would be eight over 12. So it would be um, something less than G. Why is it less than G? Because there's a bunch of mass that has to be accelerated. Um, and I, I could ask you to do that. What's a little bit harder maybe is what if I asked you, if I told you that A was one meter per second squared, M1 was four, and I asked you what M2 was, you would have to solve this for M2, which would be M1, sorry, M1A is equal to M2G minus M2A, or M2G minus A is equal to M1A, which means M2 is M1A over G minus A. And that you could do really fast. That would be four times one, so four over 9.81 minus one, so four over 8.81 whatever that happens to be, about a half, right? Um, so yeah, there's all sorts of fun stuff I could do by not giving you one or two of these variables and making you do some horrible algebra. And I, I know this isn't horrible, but imagine we had three masses with a whole bunch of forces. It would eventually start to really, really be tedious. Now, what you're about to see, is quite possibly my favorite physics problem. It's my favorite physics problem to test people on. It's one of my just favorite problems ever because it gives you a whole bunch of freedom to show how you solve things. This is what is so called Atwood machine. You take two masses and you hang them over a pulley. There's a lot here, and it doesn't look like there's a lot, but there's a lot here. Now, let's assume we have no idea which way they're gonna go. Um, we'll give the masses later, but we just need to come up with an idea of what should happen. So let's assume that two is going to go down. So A of two is going to go down, and A1 is gonna go up. If A2 drops, A1 has to go up. Now let's draw our free body diagrams for one. Force, tension, normal, weight. There are no normals in this problem. There is a tension. This is the tension from two on one. There is a weight for one. And A of one goes up. Notice I'm not putting X. Well, there's no X or Y here. There's one coordinate up or down. However, that coordinate changes. So on this side, positive is up. On this side, positive is down. So here, I get two. I have that same tension, equal and opposite third law pair, and I have weight two, but now I have A2 going down. If you can draw that, I know you understand free body diagrams. Next up, F1, A, I'm sorry, F1, is equal to M1A1, which is equal to, I chose positive up, T minus weight one. F2 is equal to M2A2, I chose positive down, weight two minus T. Now, 
let's do my favorite thing of adding these together. So I get M1 A1 plus M2 A2 is equal to T minus weight one plus weight two minus T. These cancel. I'm going to put M1 plus M2 is equal to A because A1 has to equal A2. Why? Massless, stretchless, frictionless ropes, a frictionless pulley. If one goes up, two drops. If they're going, if one is going up with certain speed, two is dropping with that speed. Therefore, these are going to equal A. This equals W2 minus W1, which is M1 plus M2. Remember, this is M2G, M1G. So M2 minus M1 G. And I'm going to put this right here in this box. Okay. A is equal to M2 minus M1 over M1 plus M2 times G. However, I made a decision that positive means it's going clockwise. It's dropping down the two side, okay? Negative would mean it's dropping this way. This is negative dropping, this is positive dropping, or negative A, positive A. Imagine I cut the rope here, I slice this. So M1 becomes zero. I get A is equal to positive G and two falls. Imagine instead of cutting it there, I cut it, on the other side, okay? Imagine I cut it here. That means <clears throat> that two is gone. And I get negative M1 over M1 because M2 becomes zero, right? So I get A is negative G. So this equation tells me what happens. And furthermore, if I gave you any two masses, let's say M2 is 47 and M1 is 15, I just plug them in. I get 47 minus 15, that's 32, over 47 plus 15, which is 62. So I get 32 over 62 times G. And it tells me the acceleration is positive, which means that because two is bigger, this system is gonna drop, this size is gonna go up, and we're good. Atwood machines are super fun. The main takeaway of them is this whole idea that you choose the positive direction of the acceleration based on the way you think it's going to fall. And it needs to be consistent between the two objects. What would happen if I had made them both up? So I had A2 being up instead of down. Well, this guy right here would have been, these would have been flipped and I would have gotten this big old mess. It wouldn't have made any sense. You have to consistently choose the acceleration along the rope. So starting here, I chose up. That means this side has to be down, okay? Always make sure things are consistent. The next part, please pay a lot of attention to. The next part's the last difficult part. If we're on an inclined plane, so this could be a block of ice sliding down a hill. The plane is considered to be frictionless. And let's say this is at some angle, okay? And this is going to go down. We could, right, there's no forces on here. There is a normal and it goes perpendicular to the surface. There is a weight and it goes straight down towards the center of the earth. There are no tensions, there are nothing else. Here I've drawn it with a force pulling up. The reason why I'll show you in a minute. But if I said, oh, well, okay, I'm gonna assume that to the right is X positive and up is Y, I'm gonna need to break every one of those forces except the weight into components. Once I do that, I'm gonna to have to put them back to figure out how it's gonna go down the incline. And that sucks. Um, that's a lot of work when instead I can do something much more fun. Um, 
I'm in physics. I can choose my coordinate system. Instead of being x, y, I can choose it to be down the incline is x positive and perpendicular to the incline is y. Okay. When I do that, I'm going to turn this so that it looks like this. Okay. And I want to show you one quick thing here. So here the weight went straight down. And you can see that it makes a 90 degree angle with this line. It's perpendicular. So let's draw the weight vector down. If I go down here, this is what I want you to pay attention to. This is a 90 degree angle. This is also a 90 degree angle. Okay. So, and finally, this is a 90 degree angle. Right. Meaning that the whole thing now. Um, I should really draw it so that you can see that whole thing is a 90 degree angle. This is theta. This is phi. That means this has to be theta because these angles have to be 90 degrees. These two angles are 90 degrees. That simply means that this angle here is also theta. And if we want to know if this is a vector, then this down is r y and this that way which is the same as this is our omega x that also means that omega y or not omega y w y is the weight times cos theta it's along the cosine this one's the same as this along the sine part so weight in the x is weight sine theta, assuming that we chose y to be positive up and x to be parallel to the surface. OK, all that fun stuff. Moving on. When we do that, the reason why we do that, and this is just showing that again, is so that we can write our free body diagram like this. Now, remember, we want f t normal and weight. I'm doing the one that has the force up. So I draw the normal, I draw the force, I turn this thing, I draw the weight, and then I draw straight down from the normal is the weight in y. Down the incline is the weight in x. You can also write these as m g cos and m g sine. I don't care. You can either call them wx or wy. I'm going to flip this though. Because I know the force is pulling it up the incline, I'm going to choose x positive up the incline. And y positive will still be up. Those are those. Now, um, if we do all that, whatever. Let's do the one without the force. I think when I wrote that PowerPoint, I was thinking of something else. So without the force, I tell you that this thing is on a 20 degree incline, this block of mass m. And I want to know what it's, its acceleration down the plane. So first things first, I turn it so that this is my 20 degrees and my block is here. What forces are here? Well, there would be a y straight down, or I mean a w straight down. So I get w in the y is mg cos of 20, because this angle is also 20. And w in the x is mg sine of 20. There has to be a normal off it. And there's no other forces. There's no tensions. Writing my equations in the x and y, I can just write m, um, m a x m a y. I'm going to choose down the incline to be x positive or a x positive. Up the perpendicular part upward will be y. These forces from this you can see are mg sine of 20 or the angle. This one, because I chose upward and is positive, or W Y is negative, 
So negative mg totes dot. Now, I still can't move off the incline, so this is still zero. And I get that the normal is mg times cos, let's just call it the angle, leave it theoretical. Okay, on an incline plane with no other forces, the normal is the weight times cosine of the angle. Does that make sense? Okay, so imagine three cases. Imagine we're at like 89 degrees. What is the normal force on this? Mg cos of 89 is essentially almost zero. As we go to 90, it's going to fall straight off. What if the angle was zero? Angle is zero. I get that the normal force is mg cos theta, but theta is zero, cos zero is one, normal force is mg. Okay. So anywhere between these two, the normal force just depends on the angle that the block is at. And the higher the angle, goes towards 90, the less the block is in contact with the surface. Until once it's straight up vertical, it wouldn't be in contact at all. For this, I can cancel the m's, and I get a is g sine of theta, or g sine of the angle. Now again, let's look at this. If this was 90 degrees, what happens here? What is sine of 90? One, right? So when the angle is 90 degrees, the acceleration of the block is purely g. When the angle is zero, the acceleration is zero. Sine of zero is zero. So the lower the angle, the less acceleration, the slower something's acceleration or velocity changes as it goes down a hill. That should make sense to you, right? You accelerate less on a shallow angle or a very small angle than you would on a very steep angle, um, assuming no friction. Friction causes all sorts of other problems. If you don't believe this is true, then go to a hill and try it. <laughs> um, but essentially, for an inclined plane with no forces, the acceleration is g sine of the angle down the incline. Okay? If I chose, and your book does this for some weird reason, if I chose x to be positive up the incline, this would be a negative. And maybe they just like to have the acceleration due to gravity to be negative, whatever. I don't put i hats and j hats on this stuff because I'm choosing all sorts of weird things. This isn't the normal x. However, it's physics. I can do what I want. I can choose my coordinate system where I want to take advantage of the fact that it saves me having to break multiple forces into um, components. I only have to deal with the weight, and I only have to remember that the weight down is mg cos, the weight down the incline is mg sine. That's super helpful. Um, we can do block on an incline with a force. I'm not really going to. I'll write the equations for you. Max is assuming that this, uh, let me do this backwards. So with a force up and assuming that x is positive up, I would get force minus mg sine theta may, which is zero, would be normal minus mg cos theta. That's not too bad. Um, you could have, and I like this problem, which is why I want to do it, and I want to do the next one too. So imagine we have a pulley and we have a mass hanging from it and we have a mass on this incline. And this inclines at some angle. This is one, this is two. So our algorithm, we draw a free body diagram for each one of these guys. One and two. Remember your force, your tension, your weight, your normal force. So number one, it has a weight. And in fact, weight of one. Um, number two actually has two weights. Because remember, we're going to turn this on its side so that it has a weight in the y, which is cosine, and a weight in the x, which is sine. So weight two cos theta and weight two sine theta. 
this one has a tension up, which means this one has a tension up. We're assuming that this is going to be the positive direction, up the incline will be positive, and then y will be up positive. All right, the last thing that we need, does this have any other forces? No, let's draw a one pointing down so that we know we're going down positive. This has a normal force, which I can call normal two if I want. A2 is positive that way, and A2y is positive up. So we've drawn all the forces. Those are the only forces on this stuff. The next step is to write M A1. Positive is down, so W1 minus T, which is M1G minus T. I have two equations for M2. M2 A2 is T minus M2 W2 sine theta, which is T minus M2G sine theta, and M2 in the A to Y, which is N2 minus W2 cos theta, which is equal to zero because of this. So this equation just gives me that the normal for mass two is M2G cos. And I don't really need to worry about this equation. I need to worry about these two. So doing that, I get M1A1, is M1G minus T. And M2A2 is T minus M2G sine theta. Remember that what you're doing here is you're basically visually drawing the forces and deciding on the positive direction of the acceleration. And you want that positive direction to stay consistent along the rope. So from two to one, positive, positive down. If I wanted this to be positive up for some reason, then this would have to be positive down the incline. Okay. Once we have that, A1 is equal to A2 is equal to A. So again, it's easiest just to add these. So I get M1 plus M2 is equal to M1G minus T plus T cancels M2G sine theta. So I have M1 plus M2 times A is M1G minus M2G sine theta. Remember that I chose, okay, I chose for the acceleration to be positive going up and going down. So that means my acceleration here is m1g minus m2g sine theta over m1 plus m2. I want to tell you guys that are still here something really important. When you're doing a test and you get to this point where you're doing your algebra, all the masses should add together. If you get m1 minus m2 times a, you've done something wrong. Newton's law says that the sum of the masses times the net acceleration, the sum of the masses, you can't have a negative mass on this side. This side, look, this is the weight of one and this is the weight of two. Our only external forces is the force uh, from the earth on mass one and the force from the earth on mass two. They are in opposite directions. So this is force two, this is force one. Our acceleration, well, our actual net force is those two forces added together, but think about them as competing to drop them in different directions. And that's what we have here. We have force one minus force two. Now, if you had chosen positive to be the opposite way, these forces would flip. It would be M2G sine minus M1G. Um, if M1G is bigger than M2G sine theta, then it's going to go and fall down and pull M2 up the incline. If M2G sine theta is bigger than M1G, as written, it's going to push that one down. So our last hard one to do 
is imagine that we have two different, I'm gonna call this data and I'm gonna call this P. This is one, this is two, and we have a pulley so they're over each other. So here we would do two different inclined planes turned on their sides, theta, B, this is one, this is two. You would just have to be careful. This is N1, this is N2, this is M2G sine theta or weight of two in the X. This is M2G cos or weight of two in the Y. This is M1G sine B. This is M1G cos B. You would have a tension, you would have a tension. Now, the last step to make this easy is you have to choose a consistent direction. So if I say that this one's accelerating up, that that's a positive x direction or the positive ax direction, then I have to assume that this one is as well, okay, as I draw them. And my force equations are m1a1y, uh, let's do x, m1a1y. What are the x if that's positive? t minus m1g sine, uh, sorry, phi on this side. n1 is positive minus m1g cos phi. But remember that zero, it can't leave the surface. M2A2X is M2G sine theta minus T. I chose that way positive. This one's positive, this one's negative. M2A2Y is N2 minus M2G cos theta. Again, zero. So N1 is equal to M1G cos B. N2 is equal to M2G cos theta. I don't care about those. Let's add these two equations together. And I get that M1A1X plus M2A2X, add the right side together, or the left side, add the right side. T minus T is zero. So this is equal to M2G sine theta minus M1G sine phi. And since A1X and A2X have to be the same, this is really, stop doing that. M1 plus M2 A is equal to M2G sine theta minus M1G sine B. Because I chose this way to be positive, if M2G sine theta is bigger, I get acceleration down this way. If M1G sine B is bigger than M2G sine theta, I get negative acceleration, meaning it goes down that side. The point is you have to make sure that your acceleration is consistent for all objects. And then when you get an answer, you need to use what you decided. Um, it means that you have to be a little creative sometimes. Uh, so just recognize that fact. You gotta do a bunch of these. There's only three sections in this chapter. And the third section has, um, Quite a few different like block on a pulley and blocks being pulled. I'm gonna give you, I'm actually gonna, it's like a combined chapter five, chapter six homework, but I'm gonna split it up into the frictions or the non-friction stuff and the friction with some other stuff. So it's going to probably be 12, 13 problems total. You'll get half of them today. You get the other half on Thursday. The exam's not till the following Thursday. So I'll talk about solutions to everything on Tuesday when we review. So I'll talk about that more in a second. The algorithm here is draw a free body diagram for each mass. And if you have it on an incline, you need to turn. Check for forces, tensions, normal forces, and weights. Weight is always mg, um, tensions, always our third law pair. So if you have a tension on one object, you might have it on the other. Um, <clears throat> step three, write F equals MA in the X direction and F equals MAY in the Y direction. But that also means you have to choose which way is positive and which way is negative. 
and I should say, and then write all the forces. They better match up to your free body diagram, by the way. There's nothing worse to me than when I see like a bad free body diagram and the equations don't even match the free body diagram. The whole point of doing a free body diagram is it's a visual representation of the two equations. So they better match and they better have clearly listed the positive directions. Um, some of the tensions may be equal and some of the accelerations are equal. We didn't do three objects, so we didn't have three different tensions, or I mean two different tensions. Um, I might do that on the review. Um, blocks can't leave surfaces, so A in the Y direction, the perpendicular direction, is always zero. Um, then follow the direction of the rope and make sure it's equal and consistent, and then use the constant acceleration equations to analyze all that means is if I tell you, if it starts from rest after a time of two seconds, how far has it gone? Or if it goes 10 meters, you know, how long did it take? Or what was its final speed? Or any of those things that we did way back in chapter two. Um, so to wrap this up, next time we're doing chapter six, and all we're doing on chapter six is adding friction. Friction is weird because it depends on the direction the object's going. And there are some really major problems um, that happen with friction. Uh, so we treat it by itself. You have to do a little bit different. It's nothing complex. If you can do today's stuff, the friction stuff is super easy. It's just different. Um, we're gonna talk about drag forces really briefly, and they will not be on the uh, exam, mostly because the drag force in this chapter six, they just give you an equation. And all you do is put numbers into it. And um, I'm not really too cool with that. I also don't like the way they derived it, but we're going to talk about it. You'll have one problem maybe on homework. But we're pretty much going to ignore that drag, um, other than a few things that I want to talk about with it. And then we're going to do uniform circular motion two. Um, two, because last time we did it, we assumed we were only horizontal. Now we're gonna go vertical and we're gonna have forces. So um, we're gonna talk about that. And that leads us, if we have friction and uniform circular motion, we can then talk about, if you've ever driven on the freeway and you got off on an on-ramp and you see the signs that say like 30 miles an hour, and you ever wonder why that sign for that turn says 30? How did they know? Did they go and test a car? Nope. Turns out, if you know the friction coefficient of the surface, or even if you don't have a friction coefficient, if the surface is banked enough, you can make a turn um, on ice as long as the banking is enough. So we're gonna talk about how to figure out the friction coefficient or the appropriate level of banking to make a turn on a car on an ice covered road with like no tread on the tires. It's a really fun thing that you can actually like check around town as you drive uh, based on the radius and the angle of the road. It's kind of weird. Um, it's something you may have never noticed and it's always great to, uh, to be able to use physics in the real world. So um, next time will be a lot more fun. It'll be a little bit less than what we did today. Um, so please go through and read chapter five. It's not the most helpful. I'll get probably later tonight, I'll get a homework for you up um, on this and I'll try to give you a few problems to like maybe six of them, um, just different configurations of things like a block and a pulley and a block on an incline and a block on an incline and a block that's flat and that type of stuff just so you have enough to, to do some fun or to do some useful examples, okay? There will be an Atwood machine on there, so make sure you go over that example. Anyway, um, I'm sure if anyone has questions, we can take them in a second. I'm gonna stop recording now. Um,